Welcome back to your favorite podcast. But, but do, do you, you have, have a real job? job? With your host, Mario Mitchell. It's me, Mario. All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast. We are here with an awesome fucking person. Um, we are here with a longtime producer, longtime musician, and a Grammy winner, and a bunch of other stuff we're going to talk about in here. He makes plugins. We're here with Joey Sturgis. How are you doing, man? Good. How are you? I'm really good, man. I'm really happy to have you on. Thanks again for taking some time to come out. I'm digging the background. Yeah. That's what I'm talking I, about. I, uh, I, you know, I, full disclosure, I have to admit, I definitely placed these very strategically on other side of my face for this camera right. view. <laughs> it looks good. Um, Down with it. You know, it's interesting, though, because it really is like... Um, it's it's important now than ever uh, to, on the internet to to show your credibility, right? Like mm -hmm. because you know if you're out there on the internet and you're talking to people and you're teaching people how to do stuff and you're telling them what they should do, giving them advice, it's like okay, yeah, but like why should I take advice from you? So I got these instant credibility things, you know. It's kind of like I know what I'm talking about, so we can get over that hump and then I can actually get into the information that's going to help you. Um, right. So the you know so it's kind of a one of those things like just an instant objection smasher kind of thing, right? Especially with social media, people want to see who the hell are you? What are you doing? Who do you work with that I know personally? You know, and that really sells it to you. Especially in the music industry, you're producing bands, helping bands grow on Spotify and other platforms, and they're like, How, "Why should I trust you?" Like you were saying. So it's good that you've got you know those in the background. And if anybody Google's you, I had a couple people saying, "You know, who's your next guest?" I saw this guy named Joey Sturgis, and they Google you, and they're like, holy shit, this guy's legit. Just from, like, the top of the page, they're like, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. So that's really good that you got that going on. Yeah, and, you know, I like to look at it a little differently than I think it, you know, there's a vanity to it as well. Like, I know when you see it, it's kind of like, okay, this guy, is he? It's, it looks kind of douchey in a way, and <laughs> for lack of a better <laughs> explanation. But, but the reality of it is, is like, this plaque right here represents helping over 5,000 people learn how to mix uh, and, and make records. And this wow. plaque right here uh, represents, you know, getting people through tons and tons of uh, personal depression and turmoil and all kinds of things that they're going through in their life. And, and this plaque also, which is covered by my head, is, is for, responsible for 100,000 uh, records sold and, and so this this is all I look at the results like why mm -hmm. why did we do all these things why are these things hanging on my wall well it's because of the results that we were able to get the people we were able to help the 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 amazing art that we created that got people through uh, horrible times um, the lives that we impacted all of that stuff is more important to me than than the vanity of the whole thing mm -hmm. and if you go and look into each one of these things that I'm I guess, boasting about on my wall, you'll see uh, that it's all really positive uh, impact on the world. And, and so that's why it's on my wall. It's not because I want to look like a, uh, I don't know, a douchebag. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't think it does at all. And I think it's good that you at least, you know, have them on the wall and you're proud of them. That's something to be proud of, too. Not everybody has those plaques, you know. But one good thing, I mean, everybody that follows you, knows you know what what's going on behind the scenes but i think a lot of people really don't give enough credit to the producers behind a lot of these records like the ones behind your head they think oh this band put out this dope record but like you were saying those records touch many people and they change people's lives for the better hopefully and you specifically had a huge part in that and i'm curious how much of a part you take in the bands that you work with like do they come in and say hey, Joey, here's all these songs. We want to record these songs. Or do they come in, they write us an album from scratch with you? Or how does that all work? So to answer the question in short, it's everything under the sun. I mean, sometimes I'm hired to do only one thing, and sometimes I'm hired to do everything. Um, and so it can really be a, a plethora of different things. So like, for example... Um, with the Reckless and Relentless album uh, with Asking Alexandria... That was a time period where the band really needed some help and some guidance when it came to songwriting. And so that was a, a situation where, you know, uh, the main songwriter in the band is Ben and the second the secondary main songwriter in the band is, is Danny. So Ben and I would sit down 
and we would be like, we need to write a song. And so some of those songs literally started with zero, like, like a completely blank canvas. Um, Someone somewhere, for example, is a song where I go, you guys need a four chord song that you can play in stadiums. And that was kind of how it began. But then that song took a crazy journey where it was like it started with just four chords and then it became this whole story about Danny and dealing with the death of his his grandfather and all those things. Um, and 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 so it's amazing how you can start with sort of a, a, a restriction or a rule set. This is something that I always tell uh, musicians, like, you know, when you want to sit down and write a song, give yourself um, some sort of like creative rule set that you can work within because it'll inspire you to do crazy stuff. Like, for example, what if you had to make a song about the coronavirus? What would you do? What would you say? How would you make it uh, unique? How would you invoke curiosity? How would you help people get through emotions and things like that? And so sometimes those kind of creative barriers can help you actually, or not barriers, those those, uh, creative limitations can help you uh, approach songwriting from a different place than you normally would. And so that's one of the things that I would do with my artists is I would sit down and and we would try to make, like, for example, I worked with a band called Miss May I. They're a a metal band and they're not known for ballads. They don't really have very many ballads. But one time I was like, you know what? Let me challenge you to make a ballad. I want to see what happens if we sat down and tried to actually do that. And that song ended up pretty cool, in my opinion. So um, I do a little bit of everything. It can be from coaching the band to writing with them to maybe they wrote everything and I make this, I come in and try and make the songs better. Um, or it could just be, I'm not touching the songs at all. All I'm doing is making them sound great. So that's kind of the, the range of work that I do. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of people do that too. You know, it could just be, Hey, mix this shit, mix the guitars, whatever. But yeah, I think a producer does a lot more than people think. And that's whenever I found my first producer, I was like, Holy shit, I can't believe you can actually make me sound like this. You know, like it's it's a whole new world, especially in today's world where technology at is, is at its peak. You've never seen more, especially for music. I mean, just everybody can record an album on GarageBand in their basement and it will sound high quality. It's fucking nuts. Yeah. And, and so like to your point where, you know, maybe producers don't get enough credit, you, you have to realize that we're not just turning knobs and pushing buttons and, and making decisions. Uh, mm-hmm. More than that, we're also creating a... Uh, an environment that is in two different spaces, one physical and one mental. So producers are creating a mental environment for the artist to uh, basically cause the artist to do the right things that will make the right record, that will make it end up becoming the thing that you listen to and that you love. And we're also creating the physical environment, which is who are they surrounded by and, and what kind of you know, what are they doing every single day and every, like, if you let a band you know, sort of leave the studio all the time and go out and go drink and do all these things, like, you're not going to, you're probably not going to get a great record. And that's just because they're too busy focused on things that aren't creating good products. Um, So it really is uh, very much in our um, responsibility to get the artist to create great art. And sometimes Mm -hmm. that can be a psychological game. It can be a, a... an environmental physical space kind of game. It can even be um, a thing where I'm, I have to be a teacher and I have to teach yeah. the artist how to tap into their own uh, creativity or I have to teach the artist how to create better songs. And mm-hmm. so it really, the producer is really doing a lot more than I think most people realize. And I understand it's always this, it's always been this thing that's lived in a gray area and it still is i mean it's it's not like uh it's a perfect job description you don't go to work every single day knowing exactly what you're going to do you go to work going i might end up babysitting somebody today or i could make a hit song or i could end up having to spend the whole day teaching the drummer how to play to a click track you never know exactly what you're going to (laughs) get i hear that quite a bit i'm like how do you people not know how to play to a click track that just seems like the most basic tool and the most basic thing that every musician just does internally, they don't even think about it being click data to try to keep the time. That's just weird to me that a recording artist doesn't know how to play to a click track. Yeah. And it well, happens. It happens all the time. It's it's actually mind boggling. I've 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 also worked with um vocalists who are actually pretty good singers. Mm-hmm. And 
singing is not always about technical ability. Singing singing's not always about, you know, oh, they can hit the notes and they can do these things. Sometimes it's about voice acting. And what I mean by that is like, you know, you take two, let me take a two singers and compare them. Like, for example, the singer from Flyleaf compared to like the singer. Um, let me think of one that's a little more plain, like uh, Alicia Keys. So Alicia mm-hmm. Keys is not doing a lot of voice acting in her in her uh, performance with her voice, but someone like Flyleaf or Shakira, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff with their voice beyond right. just hitting notes. They're they're voice acting. So I've worked with vocalists who are good at the voice acting part, but horrible at the singing part. Like they can't hit notes or they're like tone deaf. I like say you know play this melody and I I. I grab a keyboard and I go do 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 and then they go do 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 and they like don't do the same right. thing that I said and it's like mind boggling but that the reality is that you have to realize that th- these people they're artistic and they're creative and so that's that means they don't always possess the technical skills they don't always possess the um the performance part of of being like a being a professional former performer is definitely uh something that is like a skill mm-hmm. and then being naturally talented and being naturally creative is like a gift and so i think you know when you see the superstars like ariana grande they kind of have both like they they right. are a very technical amazing performer they can hit those notes they can do the voice acting thing but they're also really creative and they're able to think of uh, uh, thank you next, like these kind right. of big ideas that like can go really far. So that's that's a very rare breed. So um, a producer's job is to take, like, let's say somebody has the voice acting ability, but not the performance ability, then mm-hmm. maybe I have to find a way to uh, make that part shine and try to hide all the other stuff that they're not good at, but not not in a malicious way. It's It's really just to create great art. Um, right. Or it could be the other sense it, where maybe they're just an excellent performer, but they're they're just executing and it's too perfect. It's to a point where it doesn't deviate from what you would hear on a keyboard. You would you would have to say to them, like, I need you to ev- invoke more emotion or I want you to sound more sad or or tap into more of the lyrics and actually pay yeah. attention to what you're saying. And so mm-hmm. the producer's job is is often pretty complex. Uh, figuring out how to get those things out of artists is, is definitely uh, an ongoing uh, practice. That's There's not a science to it, really. Yeah, it's weird. Like, people just have that ear. Like, people like you and other producers that are doing really high-quality shit, you've got that ear. And you're like, I know what people are going to want to hear. And this is what people want to hear. This They don't want to hear this. And because you're a music listener, too. It's not like you're just some random fucking dude that doesn't know anything about music. You actively listen to music just like everybody else. But going back to the vocals, it seems like it would be a little easier to record somebody that's a little more plain, like me. I don't hit all the high notes. I'm not going all over the range. I'm just pretty much in, in my zone. Then working with somebody that's all over the place, because they might not hit all the notes every time. And then by the time they get to the right notes, they're already running out of air. And how hard is that to deal with going from one of the better singers to one of the, you know, more plain singers? Well, it's diff. That's a really interesting um, dichotomy, because when you're working with a plain singer, you're sort of just trying to get the right take. And it's not too difficult. Like, I mean, I guess the the difficulty comes in like me just waiting for you to get it right. And then once mm-hmm. you got it right, I'm like, oh, okay, we got it right. Let's go to the next thing. But when you're working with someone who's like extremely talented to like to the point where they could sing the song like 100 different ways, then the job becomes a completely different job because no longer am I just trying to get you to to execute all the right steps and then boom, 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 fill in the blanks. Okay, we got it. Right. Now I'm having to decide, do I want take number one, two, five, seven, ten, or 15, because you just mm-hmm. gave me 15 completely different amazing things, and I don't really know which one is the right one. <laughs> so, right, and real quick before, I don't want to interrupt and finish your thing, but you also have to figure out what people are going to want to inherently sing along to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, sorry, and sometimes that, that can be the, the deciding factor. Maybe when I'm listening to it, I'm going, wow, like you are really uh, – showing off and and demonstrating some amazing vocal ability but i've got to stop you there because nobody's going to sing along to this thing when Mm -hmm. you're christina aguilera all over the damn thing and (laughs) and no one knows what the real melody is because you're just so 
it's it is a it's a balance and you have to find the right spots to let the artist uh showcase their their ability and their skill but you also have to find the the places where the audience can connect and follow along right so would you rather work with a solo artist going in rather than a whole band because it seems like to me under oath is one of these big examples i used to watch this documentary and they were talking about how every single member would need to sign off, essentially, not literally, probably, but sign off on the song before they can move on. So would it be harder for you personally to work with a full band, you know, five to eight members? Or would it be easier to just work with one guy, hone in on that guy's talent or quality and just go from there? So I, I've been fortunate enough to work with over 500 different artists in my career, and I've experienced basically every possible scenario from bands being controlled by the guitar player to the band having equal say to the band having two members who control most of everything, but the other three members kind of have a little bit of a say, mm -hmm. like all the different things, right? And for me, um, I just got really good at dealing with all those different scenarios. And and one of the bands, which I don't want to throw them under the bus, but I'm sure they, they've done enough interviews where you can go track down all this information. It's all publicly out there. I'm not throwing them under the rug or anything here. Right. Uh, the Devil Wears Prada was pretty uh, headstrong in the sense that every single person had a, a, a different perspective for what the song was supposed to what each song was supposed to be how it was supposed to come out mm -hmm. and you over time when you work with these artists over and over again you start to learn their tendencies you start to learn okay well chris is definitely going to want the riff to stand out um james is going to want the keys to be really loud because he's tired he's tired of being buried by the band yeah. uh, mike is going to want the song to sound super heavy jeremy uh, is going to care a lot about his lead parts because he doesn't get a lot of them and so you kind of like learn all these different little things and you figure out as a producer, you figure out how do I not only make the song great and accomplish all the stuff that the song needs to do to be a great product, but how do I also give, give all the different band members what they're looking for, what they're trying to get out of the song. And yeah, sometimes you're going to have some compromises. Sometimes you're gonna have to say, Jeremy, I know you really wanted that lead, but it's so busy right here. We got to take it out because there's just too much stuff going on. But yeah, We'll make it up on a different song or or mike i know you really wanted this breakdown to be super brutal but we need to put some keys in here to uh build up to the next part um and and not make it so uh you know juxtaposition from part to part and there's yeah. there's different thing there's different ways to approach all of this um but i've i've dealt with it all and i think the biggest thing that you have to do as a producer when you're in this uh, position is you have to remind yourself every single day of two different things. Number one, you have to remind yourself that you're on the same team and everybody's trying to make a great record. So when somebody makes a suggestion or when somebody says, I don't like that part, it's because in their mind, it makes the record the re the best record that it can be. And it makes, and it's pushing the whole team towards the goal. Mm -hmm. And so the, the reality of that uh, realization is that you have to you have to sometimes make compromises and you have to sometimes make sacrifices and you have to think of it as a whole team uh, participation. Right. The second thing that you got to remind yourself every single day as a producer is that you're just the producer. At the end of the day, this band has to take these songs on the road, play them every night, be satisfied with what they did, mm -hmm. sell it to their fans. They've got to stand behind this work for the rest of their lives. Yeah. So if you're trying to push something on them and you're and you you really do think like man this is the thing that's going to make this record a lot better but the band doesn't want to do it and you're pushing them and you're pushing them you got to remind yourself it's not yours. The you're just the producer. It's not your songs. It's not your art. And right. yeah, maybe somewhere on paper you have a small percentage of it, but the reality is they've got to go out there and play that song every single night to their fans and sing every single word over and over and over again. So I, I really encourage artists to, to do what they want to do, to do what they have to do and what they, what they believe in doing. And mm -hmm. so sometimes that means me taking a backseat. Right. And it's crazy how you even sleep at night <laughs> with all these <laughs> decisions rolling on you, because not only does a band have to listen to it, you got all the fans that are waiting for it too. And you have to be able to put that music in their ear and they're like, okay, I fucking love this shit. And it sounds big and heavy or whatever band you're working with. It's got to sound 
you know, just like that. And I think a producer does a really good job of honing in on the band sound. Because sometimes the band doesn't even know what they want to sound like. They just write a bunch of songs. They're like, yo, make this sound like an album. You're like, dude, you got 10 different songs that sound totally different. And then you have to come in and say, here's how we're going to make it all sound the same. So it's all fluid and it's all going to make sense on one record. So fucking props to you and all the producers for for making the best music decisions out there. Um, yeah. One of my uh, one of my techniques that I use is um, I will I'll hit I'll sit down and I'll play a song and it'll let let's say it's a demo from a band mm-hmm. and uh, I'll listen to the demo and I'll just pretend like if something cool doesn't happen like every five to ten seconds that the song starts to become more boring for me and and so like that's that's one of the things that I've learned as a producer is like when you listen to a song and you get to the end and you go, whoa, it's over already? That's crazy. Like, that's when you know you've done your job because the song is interesting and keeps the listener engaged all the way mm-hmm. through from very beginning to the very end. No parts are boring. And yeah. that's the hardest thing to do. And so when you approach your demos with that mindset, like, oh, man, this is this part's getting boring. Like, why do we repeat this riff like four times? Then don't do it. Don't repeat it four times. I know you think that you should for some reason, and maybe you heard something somewhere that taught you to do that. But Mm -hmm. if it makes the song boring, then why are you doing it? You're just trying to do something that you thought was the right thing to do rather than make the song interesting. And that's, so that's one of the things that I think led me to a lot of success was to always keep the song evolving, always keep everything interesting and keep the listener engaged as they go through the song. Right. And I think one good thing about producers and people in general, but it's like so many bands hear another band, especially young bands, you know, 15 to 21, they hear, they hear a band and they're like, holy shit, I want to sound like that. And then they write all their music trying to sound like that instead of saying, okay, what do I actually like listening to? Because if you try to do that, it's just like, oh, you sound like that one band. You don't want to sound like another band. You want to say this sounds like Prada or this sounds like, you know, a mirror or whatever, because all these bands are in the same genre but you know what band's what band. Yeah, and so preserving the identity of an artist is is super important, um, but also I think in part, just as important is to challenge the artist and to have them reach into new territories that further increase their identity as, as, a, as a band or as an artist as they go on. And this is something that um, I was always sort of capable of doing with each artist and always in in my own little weird way like for for example when i worked with we came as romans i was always challenging the drummer to make his drum parts actually be a lot more like vocals like in the sense that a vocal melody is kind of like a couple different notes and a rhythm and a pattern and some lyrics and you when you Mm -hmm. memorize it it becomes like this thing that you can like do and i'm like when you're playing your drums like you don't get to make notes but at the same time, you have different crash symbols. You have a snare. You have a kick. You can play different patterns. And you can do this in a certain way to where, like, even your drum parts are, like, vocal melodies. Because yeah. you hit the china on the one, and then you go to the hi-hat, and then you hit the snare with the crash two times. And then you go back to the china on the one, and the hi-hat mm-hmm. and the crash two times. And then this creates, like, this cool sound effect that, like, is memorable, almost like a lyric. And so every record I would I would take take the band and be like look you know last time we made this record we did this is what we did i'm going to challenge you now to play a, a harder guitar part or to make a, a a drum part more complex or you know and i would always just basically challenge the artists to reach into reach down into their uh their abilities and try to pull out new things and get them to utilize those things to make the songs more interesting and um, I think my, you could probably speak to a lot of the people that have worked with me and they probably really appreciated me trying to do that at the same time as trying to make a great record, which mm-hmm. is um, sort of like stacking uh, responsibilities on top of myself. But, uh, right. you know, for me, it was it was fun. And I the, the process of making records became so easy for me after doing so many. I've done over 100 if you go look at my discography that a lot. for me it was like we got to make these bigger and better to keep this thing more interesting for me mm, so right 
not only do I want to challenge you, but I'm challenging myself in the same sense that I want to keep things in more and more interesting every single time. Right. It's interesting you brought up the Wickham and Romans drummer because I have, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people have looked up to that guy like one of the best drummers ever. Seriously, dude's crazy. And it's cool that you were like, dude, you got to, you know, try out some different stuff because it is literally like what you said. It's like vocals. Like you, a lot of musicians can listen to a song and not only do they hear, you know, the vocals, but they're like, playing to the drum beats like all all the off note hits you know you got a lot of the off hit uh i don't even know what the fuck i'm gonna say but it's just like not on time it's like more on the one and the three i don't know yeah that on the upbeat yeah right yeah and they're doing that and it's just like it's so cool because it changes the whole vibe immediately so the drummer has a lot of say in the song for sure and with, especially with people like that the we came as Roma's drummer, he's all over the place. He's doing shit the whole time. It seems like the whole thing is like a big fill, but it makes <laughs> sense too. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, working with those guys has always been great. And, um, you know, another, another great example is, uh, Ryan Neff, who really never mm-hmm. considered himself a singer, um, singing for Miss May I now. And every time he would come in, we would, we would raise, the the highest note that he's going to sing and then the next record they would come in and i'd be like up oh, you're going to beat that note this time we're going to somewhere we're going to find a spot where there's one little note higher than that and then right. the next time you come in and he would get nervous you know he would come yeah. in for the record and he would get he'd start getting nervous being like joey i know you're going to make me sing one note higher than the one <laughs> the last time we did it and uh you know what though he rose to the occasion every single time and the reason why he got nervous is because he knew that if he if we had that note in the song it was something he would have to do live and it was something mm-hmm. that he would have to do every single night. And what people don't realize is that as a rock star, when you are, you know, basically beckoned to sing these notes every single night, it's like, well, that means I got to cut back. I'm going to take one less drink every night mm-hmm. because if I take that extra drink, I'm not going to be able to hit that note or, oh, now I've got to go sleep an extra 30 minutes or an extra hour every day. Because if I don't sleep that extra hour, I'm not going to be able to hit that note. And so by challenging these artists to to be at peak performance, they realized that's a massive sacrifice. Like if you're on a 30-day yeah. tour, that's 30 extra hours you're going to have to commit to sleeping to be able mm-hmm. to hit that note every night. And I have to hand it to him. He he did it. You know, he would he would take it and take it in stride and and be serious about it and really approach it. And it made him a better musician. And that's what I think is the ultimate appreciation or even the ultimate like that's what I'm like really have done as a producer. Yeah, I've sold records and done all these things. But what I've really done is I've improved people's artistic ability. And I think that's something that they're probably uh, forever grateful for in their life. Oh, yeah. And me, too. My producer, like, when I first went in to record my very first song, I was even nervous. I'm like, I've never sang a song in a studio. I don't know how to do this. I'm nervous. And this is four years ago. And now I'm so comfortable in what I'm doing and what he's helping me do. It's just like an everyday, like, riding a bike at this point. I mean, it's not like you can just wake up and ride a banger. You know, you got to, you know, still work on it and make it sound good and have a good situation to discuss. But having a good producer that really can make you sound like you It really fucking helps, especially when you're in the studio working with them day in and day out, watching their little things. And they're telling you, you know, we're going to try one hoe higher. And then by the end of it, now he's singing kind of like whatever he wants. And he's not I don't know if he still gets nervous now, but he probably gets less nervous every time he comes in. Well, you know, creating the that, um, I guess, opportunity for that artist really does allow them themselves to build their own confidence and to to Mm -hmm. create that that space, that safe space where they can experiment with their voice. And, and, you know, that's, that's a big thing. Cause it's like, not everyone is comfortable. Like it's different when you're on stage and there's a bunch of people that have paid money to, to see you and they definitely want to watch you perform. Like that's one thing, but like just walking around like outside and just opening your mouth really loud and making noises with your throat and stuff right. is, is weird. Right. It's, it's just fucking weird. And it's so I think creating that safe space for the artist, allowing them to experiment with their voice and do things in front of other people and and maybe even behind closed doors in front of a microphone, so to speak, is where you can get really creative and you can actually create some very amazing 
moments that are captured on records um, by doing that. And, and it's always been my thing where I know I intimidate the artist. I, I work with a lot of like I, I'm working with a, a, a band right now and I know the singer tells me straight up like you intimidate me like I'm nervous to sing this song and I'm I'm always I'm always like yeah I understand where you're coming from but you have nothing to be nervous about because all I'm going to do is bring out the best in you and yeah. sometimes that like mindset that mentality with the, the session is all you really need to like break the ice and then get the best that you can get out of the artist and and I've been really good at that because I'm I'm pretty calm in nature. Like I'm, I don't get super hyper and I, whenever I have an idea that I want to like, um, introduce, I always come up with a really logical reason for why, you know, I think it's a good idea. And so I bring my ideas to the table without very much emotion. I bring them to the table with, with, you know, logic and reason. And, and so I think that makes a lot of people comfortable. I think it, it allows us to really explore like, um, a lot of things in the studio. And, and that's, I think what I'm good at as a producer is being able to right. do that with artists. Yeah, that's awesome. Now you, you've got these big records on the wall, you got your name on a lot of plaques and on a lot of music, but you weren't always the popular, you know, you didn't start off writing fucking records for asking Alexandria. How long did it take you from the start of you saying, I want to be a producer how long did it take you from that point to be able to say, holy shit, I'm actually making a full time living off this? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, it, it did unfold organically. Uh, and I've told the story um, several different times, but to so, sort of break it down in a, in a uh, digestible um, um, storyline timeline, I, I essentially worked at a computer shop. I played drums in a band at the same time. We made a demo, put it on MySpace. It blew up. I don't know why, but it just did. People wanted to know where we recorded. So we told them, well, we didn't record anywhere. We recorded it ourselves. And in fact, it was our drummer that, you know, did all this stuff. His name mm -hmm. is Joey. So these people are like, well, I want to work with that guy. And I don't care who he is or what he's done or where he's at. Right. Like, just tell me where to drive my car so that I can work with them. That's how crazy the demand was. But at that time, I had nothing. I was sleeping on a couch. I was trying to live on my own. I, I could live with my parents, but I didn't want to. So I was sleeping on this couch in my in my friend's garage, which he mm -hmm. turned into like a makeshift recording studio. And the timeline breaks down like this. I'm working the job. I'm recording bands on the weekend. I figure out I can actually make more money recording bands full time if I eliminated my job, which I wasn't getting paid much for anyway. So I quit the job, I record full time and I'm working out of my friend's studio. So I own none of this stuff. Like this is not my equipment. It's not my space. All right. I get kicked out of that space. And at the time I had a manager and uh, I'm fast forwarding like years and years. So, I, mm -hmm. you know, the, the answer to the question is probably about five years. But in this time span, uh, you know, all of these different things happened to me where I had to figure out how to get ahead. I, I, when I lost the space, I'm like, well, I got to buy my own stuff and I got to mm -hmm. get my own space. So I bought a house. I moved in there, started band, started coming to the house instead of the garage that I was living in. And so all these things sort of stacking up. Now, this is the thing that's like kind of crazy about the answer to the question, because to me, it never looked like that there was success. You know, I was, I was looking at things like, oh, look at the Slipknot record. It just came out and it went platinum. Or, oh, look at the corn, you know, look at what corn is doing over here. Look at what this band. So I'm looking at these different like mega artists. But at the mm -hmm. time in my head, it didn't seem, you know, it wasn't like, oh, well, they're mega artists. That's why they're successful. It was kind of just like, well, they have the better record, they have the bigger audience. And so right. it never really, to me, looked like, like, oh, this is going to be the most popular record at all. And in fact, I was almost shocked every single time. It's like, it's almost like you would learn your lesson, right? Like you would do a couple records for a few years, you get used to selling uh, a lot of records, and then a record, a new record comes out, and then you hear about the results and you're like, oh yeah, that's what I expected. But no, that never happened. Like it was always unexpected results. It was like, 
we would release a record and it would sell more than last time, then release another record two years later and it would sell even more the first week. And then, mm-hmm. and so I think I had the luxury and I have to uh, sort of be humbled by this, uh, this reflection is that I think the, I was on a wavelength with the bands that often does not happen in the, in the history of music. I was producing bands that were growing rapidly while I was also growing rapidly as a producer. And I think right. those two things combined is what basically created my career and my trajectory. And it's not like I'm personally responsible for it. Yes, I'm definitely somewhat responsible because I was a part of it and a very big right. part of it. But I'm, I think also just as equally as responsible are the artists, the record labels, the managers, the the booking agents, all the people that got involved in that that time period with that genre and the, a lot of the work that I did. Mm-hmm. Go look at all those people today. They are mega successful. Like they were yeah. all building their career at the same time. Like Rise Records sold for a, a huge number, millions yeah. and millions and millions of dollars to BMG. You have uh, some of these bands now signing major record label deals, Mm -hmm. some of them selling out stadiums and things. But at that time, they were literally playing shows like 45 minutes from my house. And it's crazy because I live in a small town. So that's like they're playing a show for a village and now they're playing shows for an entire city. And so I have to I just have to look back and go, wow, like what a amazing right place, right time, right combination of everything like also got a hand to my parents to let me do whatever the hell I wanted to do. I didn't go to college. Mm-hmm. I graduated high school barely. Uh, <laughs> and then and then just immediately started working. And then uh, from there, like quit my job. That was the only real job I ever had was working at that computer shop. And to be honest, it wasn't even that real of a job. It was just kind of like a, a thing where my boss needed something to do. His dad was a doctor. And so he started a computer repair shop. We didn't make very much money. He didn't make much money. I didn't get paid much. So it was like this thing where I like never really worked for corporate America, never really even understood that whole lifestyle. I've always worked for myself. And I know your podcast is very much about like, do you have a real job? And and so I'm I'm kind of like, I don't know. I don't think I've ever really had a real job <laughs> until right. until now where I have built companies that have employees and those people rely Mm -hmm. upon me and my ability to go out there and create value for the market. So now I do feel like I have a real job, but even in the sense that even there's still that sense that it's not a real thing because it's just kind of like, well, that just started as like a cool idea in a garage or, Oh, that just started as like a a podcast, which then grew into a, you know, a 5,000 member, global education platform for producers like it's crazy to think about um Mm -hmm. and so yeah my 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 hindsight is 2020 but at the time i had no idea i had no idea right and it you couldn't have had any idea like how much of a success all the bands you were working with would have and you couldn't have imagined that you would have a part in that that's literally fucking insane like asking alexandria attack attack you you took attack attack to the top immediately you know what I'm saying? Like so fucking quick. And it's it's so hard to process that when it's happening and you're like, oh, OK, you know, just another record, whatever. But now 10 years later, it's like, holy shit, look what I did for these bands, you know, and they did it for themselves, too. Right. Without them, they wouldn't have you wouldn't have been able to do that. But it's crazy with asking Alexandria, Motionless and White. I don't know if you worked with them, but back in the day, this agent, Amanda Fiore, I think that was her name, but she was, you know, booking tours for them. And she was like, hey, I got this uh, band coming through, you know, your town on the way home. Most motionless and white asking Alexandria. This is like 2008, I think. And she's like, it's 100 bucks each for the package. And, you know, 200 bucks total, maybe some catering, whatever. But that was 2008 for the, now two of the biggest metal bands of all time. And they were getting 200 fucking dollars. How much were you getting paid whenever all this stuff started fucking like popping off? <laughs> <laughs> so um i i definitely paid my dues man i i've made some records that i didn't get paid very much in fact the first um the first uh devil Wars Potter record i i believe if i'm not mistaken i think i did it for 800 bucks Damn. Um, which will probably blow a lot of people's minds but you know it it's one of those things where i worked my way up to being able to ask for fifty thousand dollars to do an album 
and and you earn that right because you know there's a certain level of you know quality that comes along and a, a certain level of expectation that comes along with that price tag if you're asking for that much money you better be delivering uh, an amazing album and mm-hmm. by god i got to the point where i was able to do it with my eyes closed and so it <laughs> it wasn't hard to to well you know i i guess i guess i i I probably shouldn't I probably shouldn't downplay it. It's definitely hard. Making yeah, a great is. record is hard. It always is. You go through a lot of things. But I got used to it. I got good at it. And and so it wasn't hard for me to ask for that much money because I knew that I could give them exactly what they wanted. And it, and it was right. able I was able to build basically a, a, a sort of a factory over here. We we had a guy full-time for vocals, a full-time guitar dude, full-time drums. And then, and then me sort of bouncing around all the stations and and being able to make records really rapidly and do do a really really good job. Now that wasn't to say, you know, I think there's this very weird stigma that like, oh well, the producer should have his hands in everything and he should have to, you know, uh, specifically manipulate every single sample and move everything around. And it's like, right. no, like that doesn't make any sense because if if I am like, think about it like this. If you wanted to build a really tall skyscraper, are you going to make one guy hammer every single nail all by himself and screw every single screw? You think that's mm-hmm. going to make the building better right. and more stable and more st- structural integrity? Like it, it takes a team. And I actually had to fight uh, for my idea to have a team w- work on a record because people just didn't understand my mentality. My mentality was look, if I have to listen to your song uh, a thousand times, I'm going to hate it. And if I'm going to hate it, do you think it's going to be something I want to work on, something that I'm excited about? You want mm-hmm. me to be excited about your song because I'm. that's gonna. That's what's going to make it better. And so it was right. actually better for me to hear the song le- like the least amount of times. Like, And, and I think people now understand that, um, especially when technology has made it a lot easier for people to experiment on their own time at their own, in their own Mm -hmm. homes, things like that. But back then it was kind of like, people would be like, yo, like, why isn't Joey here? And it's like, yeah, but dude, I'm not there because you haven't even decided what you want to sing about yet. So what do you want me to do? Like sit around and, and wait for you to figure it out. Like I, I, I'm going to go over here and work on something else and, and multitask while you're doing that so that we can move this thing along faster and, and create a better yeah. product and all these things. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think, you know, I've, I've been blessed to, to work on a lot of different stuff in a lot of different capacities. And I think mm-hmm. what I ultimately learned, my favorite thing is, is, is helping an artist reach that point where they're able to take off and do whatever it is that they want to do. So if you look back in my history, that's kind of what I've done with a lot of my bigger artists, like the Asking Alexandria of Mice and Men, We Came as Romans, Attack Attack. I helped them along and I and I helped build them up as artists and I built up their their uh, their material and got them to the point where they were like, okay, now we know how this works. Now we can work with this guy or we can go back to Joey if we want to or we can mm-hmm. experiment and do this thing. It gave them the the platform to the launch pad essentially to jump off of. And right. uh, I'm very proud of that. I would be too. I mean, fuck. Literally millions of people have heard your music. That's insane. How hard is it? Like, what's the hardest part about being a producer? And personally for you? Um, it's definitely the... It, it that changes over time for sure, but I I would say these days the hardest part of being a producer is the uh the probably the time. It it takes a long time to to you have to put in a lot of time, and that's something I don't have a lot of anymore because of uh, all the things that I've gotten involved with and and all of the responsibilities that I have with my companies and things like that. So the not having enough time is is definitely you know that's that's the hardest part um and now the other hard part too is being able to recognize when something is right it has changed a lot back in the day like you could essentially listen to an artist and sort of be like oh i know what we need to do 
but now I think uh, music listeners are a lot more open minded and there's a lot more different sort of cross breeding of genres out there. Mm -hmm. So now like the right answer is not always as clear uh, as I think it used to be. So yeah. sometimes that can be challenging in, in, in and of itself is the fact that you can take a, you know, a metal artist and give them a pop sound or you can take a pop artist and give them a, a metal sound and it can be amazing. Like look at Poppy, mm -hmm. you know, Poppy went from, from straight radio pop to like being signed by Sumerian and playing right. breakouts. It's the most crazy. metal label <laughs> out there. <laughs> So I think now the difficulty is is the time, right? And then being able to figure out the direction because the direction now, the options for the direction, the options for the vision is so wide that like mm -hmm. it's it's almost like throwing a dart at a dartboard. You're just sort of like, I don't know, <laughs> like we could go a lot of different ways. So right. yeah, that's that's tough. And those Travis Scott music videos now, the comments are just great. They're like producer or director. Travis, what kind of video effects do you want? Travis, yes. You know, because that's how many options there are now. You can just do anything you want. It's fucking insane. Um, I want to wrap this up in a minute. I'm actually mad because I had a lot of stuff I wanted to talk about with the plugins. But so I did a podcast recently with a DoorDash YouTuber. And around 55 minutes, it just like randomly cut off. And I was like, what the hell? And then it didn't end up saving to the thing. I was like, what the hell? I just did the whole podcast. Now I got to redo it later on in the, in the thing. So I don't want to run past time with the Skype and test its uh, patience with me. <laughs> but okay. next time I'll bring, I'll bring you on, like, you know, at the end of the year at some point, we'll talk about your plugins. I really wanted to get into that because I'm more interested in knowing more about that and how people can use those plugins to benefit their own music if they produce themselves. Even if they go into a, 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 a another producer, they could benefit from those plugins. Um, two more questions. Um, one, I really wanted to ask you a quick answer if you wouldn't mind, just about the mixing and mastering I'm curious about. Do you do your mixing and mastering in-house? And if you don't do it, why don't you? So I, I do. And one of the the things, like, I, I am one of the kind of people who want, want to basically control as much of the record as possible because I know what makes it good. I mm -hmm. know how to record the drums. I know how to edit them. I know how to mix them. I know exactly what I want to do. Every single little step of the of the recording process, I know how I want it to be and I know how to approach it. So I want to be in control of those things because if I hand off control of one of those parts, it's now up in the air if it's going to be done correctly or if it's going to be done in the best way that I, that I know is possible. So um, I mix all my own stuff. I've almost never... I think there was only one time, yeah, there was only one time that I am uh, immediately aware of right now in my mind of when I did not mix a record that I produced and it was one of the asking records and it was simply a scheduling problem. Mm. I, I had a band in the studio recording, I had another band that I was mixing and uh, another band scheduled right afterwards with another record mixed as well at the same exact time. So I was like, there is nothing I can do unless I want to take all this money that's in my bank account and just give it back to all these people just to mix your record, which right. is really not smart for me. And so I had to be like, look, guys, I cannot do it unless you can wait two months. Mm -hmm. Then I can do it and it will be awesome. I promise you the mix will be the most amazing mix you've ever heard in your life. In fact, I've already mixed one of the songs so you can hear that I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Mm -hmm. But I just don't have the time to do the rest of the songs right now. And they were like, we love the mix, but we can't wait. So give us the files. So I had to give them the files, and then they ended up mixing with someone else. So it was only one time. So right. the, the big reason for me is I want to have the control. I know exactly what went into the record, how we made it, why we did what we did. And so then I'm going to know, okay, this is what we need to do to make it sound great. And so right. being in control is the best position for me, yeah. Yeah, I think it's good, too. I, I've always wondered why people do that. It does make sense. Oh, this person specifically knows how to do this and that. I want to do that. But yeah, I think it's good if the producer himself does it. My producer does it. It's just like makes it easier on everybody. He knows what he already did and what he can do to make it sound perfect. So I think that's good. Um, last two questions I wanted to ask. I guess one of them you already covered. Your first job was uh, at the computer shop, you said, I think. Yeah, I mean, I can, you know, we can go back even further. And I, I think I was like, you know, I was a paper boy for a little while. 
Mm. I think everybody sort of has one of those early jobs um, yeah. where you, you know, you shoveled snow or you detasseled yep. corn or you delivered newspapers. I had that, but I didn't like, that wasn't a real like actual, like, oh, I'm employed and I, you know, I get like a W2 and blah, 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 right. blah, blah. So the real job, the only real job I had was the computer shop. And, and the way that I got it was through vocational school. So the last two years of my high school, I enrolled in a vocational which means you go to like another school, like for the half of the day where you get focused on um, whatever it is that your sort of career path is. So for me, it was mm -hmm. computers. So I was working on A plus certification. Um, and then I, I rose to the top of my class, which gave me the, uh, it, it, it gives you the point where they go and, and they like uh, pitch you for like jobs. And so then mm -hmm. I landed the job and then, Basically, my last two years of high school, I would go to school in the morning at like eight o'clock. I would get out at lunchtime at like 11 or 12 and I would go to work from like yep. from 11 or 12 to five. And then so I literally had like almost almost a nine to five job like for my last two years of high school. And I, I went with that job for a while until, you know, I have this story that I always tell. Um, there was this moment where we went on a service call. We charged 70 dollars an hour for a service call. I'm on the call by myself, which is unusual. So it it didn't always irk me. And this will make sense in a minute. But this time it irked me because I was the only person there. And I and I remember thinking to myself, I've been here for an hour. I did all the work. I did it by myself. Nobody else was here with me. And I'm handing the lady the invoice. And the invoice says $70. And in that moment, I realized I'm only getting paid six bucks right now. And my boss is making 60 yeah. whatever dollars. And I'm like, holy shit, like, I cannot let this happen to me ever mm -hmm. again. And that was the moment when I just literally could not take the job seriously anymore. And I, I basically had to quit. And and that's when the recording business picked up. Yeah, uh, uh, fucking six dollars. I remember those days. I, my first job was like five fifty an hour. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, hell yeah, I'm rich. I'm in high school. I got some money. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the podcast name is But Do You Have a Real Job? Because you probably got it too when you first started producing maybe not your parents but just people that know you They're like yeah yeah i know that's what you do but like what's your real job you know like what's your nine to five where do you go to work in your opinion what would a real job be uh like just for anybody or for me it is a general question for anybody like a real job a real job is when you provide a some sort of value that people depend on I, I think that's what defines a real job because without you there, the value that you're bringing goes away and now people either have a lower quality of life or they suffer in some sort of way or there's a pain that's not being solved because mm -hmm. you're not there. That's when you have a real job. So there's different layers of that, right? Like I, I guess you could say, well, my manager who owns a McDonald's franchise she's going to be experiencing a lot of pain because i'm not there to flip those burgers for her but right. is that really a real job like are you really feeding the hungry mm -hmm. um so i think like there's definitely tears to it and i and i think uh the more responsibility you have the more money you're going to earn because that's just the way the world works like yeah. a lot of people love to point fingers at jeff jeff bezos and say wow you're so unbelievably rich like like you don't deserve that or you should you should do this with your money. But the reality is that guy made a whole lot of people millionaires. And in fact, probably po uh, uh, responsible for making the most number of millionaires in the world. If you actually go and look yeah. at it, like all the stock investors who invested early, they're all now millionaires. All the people who have six figure jobs like those are people who are going to make in a 10 year time period make millions of dollars like we're just working at a, at a place he's provided jobs he's changed education he's he's changing the the entire world with one mm -hmm. company it's mind-blowing so i think people like that have real real jobs like you want to get yeah. down to it like jeff bezos has a real <laughs> real yeah. job and it's crazy a lot of people i mean walmart too amazon these people when they first started they didn't have a million fucking customers. They didn't have one customer. They didn't have any customers. They started in a garage most of the time in some shitty room. They're like, okay, how am I going to build this? People laugh at them. Ha ha, Amazon, Psh, fucking idiot. That is never going to work. And then it's one of the, it is the biggest company in the world. And now people are like, give me that money. 
He was like, fuck you, bitch. You weren't even around when I was literally grinding. And now you're like, oh, why are you so rich? It's because I worked my ass off. And yeah, I think people like that deserve all the things that they get. And they help a lot of people. They make people rich. They pay taxes. They, you know, it's just crazy how much influence they have. But yeah, people hate them. It's like they don't hate you till you're rich. Then they really hate you. Then they want that I money. I think when you focus on you focus on the uh, the reality of that it's it's a trade, not a transaction. Mm-hmm. That's when I think it, your mind can open up and and learn how to do this correctly and become successful. Because the way I look at it is, the more value I can pack into what I'm doing, the more impact I can create on the person that that is relying on that from me. And if I can increase that impact i can get them closer to either their result or their goal and the more people i can get closer to that result or that goal the more successful i will be because i'm helping other people succeed and so that's the that's the forefront of of the the growth strategy is increase the results because if you Mm -hmm. increase the results then other people will be like i want those results too and when they see that you're the reason why the result was created then you're the one that becomes um sort of celebrated and so that that's always been my chase the value and the the money will follow rather than chase the money right and i'm really excited to do that course i'm fucking hyped up to do it especially after this podcast i'm like all right this is going to be a really cool course i'm really disappointed we didn't get into more but that's okay you did a lot of you have a lot of good information i'm glad we got it all out of you in this podcast so everybody thanks for listening to but do you have a real job we were here with joey sturgis where should everybody find you? I mean, if they just look you up, they'll probably find you. Yeah, just literally Google my name. I'm all over the place. And if you really want to talk to me directly, you can DM me on Instagram. Uh, my username is Joey is Music. It's spelled J O E Y I S M U S I C K. So, like, sick. Like, that was a sick breakdown. So, there you go. Joey is Music. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Thank you again so much for coming on, man. It really means a lot. You gave me an hour of your time to discuss all this awesome shit. And uh, I'm really, really looking forward to that course, man. It's going to be awesome. Thanks for having me. And uh, for all of you out there, good luck with everything that you're doing. Focus on value first, and I promise you, your life will be better. But do you have a real job?